So, uh, so welcome to Inspired Ghost Tracking's uh, lecture. We're going to talk about the case files of Inspired Ghost Tracking, which is um, uh, my seventh book uh, that I've written. If you look back here, you can see the cover of it. Um, and it's on Amazon.com. Um, so a little bit about Inspired Ghost Tracking. Uh, Margaret, the the founder of Inspired Ghost Tracking, is online here, and she can she can tell you a little bit about the group. Margaret. Hey y'all, it's Margaret. Um, I am coming live from my home through Rob's phone. And Inspired Ghost Tracking was um, formed back in October 2008, and um, it was a meetup group, and we have our core group that we do private investigation. The meetup group, we have these um, lectures as well as go on public investigation, and the core group goes on private investigation. So if you have something in your home, you contact us and we'll come out and see what we can find. Um, don't think I have too much more on that one, Rob, but back to you. Okay, uh, well, Margaret, before you go back to me, um, can you explain just briefly to everybody that's listening um, how you got inspired, if you will, to, uh, to form the group from your old yellow house? Okay, and so uh, you're celebrating, um, is, this is 10 years, right? Or 11 years? Um, 12 years. 12 years, okay. Yep, it was 2008, so. Excellent. All right, well, thank you, Margaret. Um, and um, a little bit more about the group. There, there are uh, less than 15 senior investigators that uh, go out on, on different groups, and uh, in different investigations. And we go to private homes, we go to historic places, um, and um, usually how, how this works, how paranormal investigations work, is that people who are having paranormal problems will contact Margaret through the website and they will fill out a form, and uh, which is lengthy, uh, to explain the different occurrences that they're experiencing, and the times that they're experiencing them, how many people live in the home, which people in the home are being uh, uh, affected, if there are any children in the home that are being affected. And usually the ones with children are the ones that we prioritize. Um, so, uh, so Margaret actually takes all of these, uh, these forms in and she goes through them and then she'll interview the client, usually on, on the phone or uh, in person. Uh, right now, of course, with the COVID restrictions, it's mostly, uh, it, it's on the phone. So um, with the investigations that we've been doing since 2010, um, Margaret would would invest, uh, sit down with them in person. And then we would form two groups. This is how our group works. Uh, it may be different for other paranormal groups. But we have a technical team that goes in with scientific equipment, that is uh, digital thermometers, digital recorders, um, infrared cameras, high-speed cameras, um, K2 meters, which measure uh, electric, electricity, um, electrical current, and electric, electromagnetic fields, because ghosts basically are energy. They're beings of energy. Um, and we can detect them that way. Um, so they go in at one point and they they do usually an overnight or they set up for for several hours 
and then the mediums will go in. Um, now, on occasion, we flip-flop that, depending on the severity of the, the case. Um, so there are a number of cases in, in the case files of inspired ghost tracking that, uh, that, we, sh that we shared here. Um, and one thing that you need to know is if, if you decide to be a paranormal investigator, you never know what to expect when you go into a home. First of all, every, everybody lives differently. And, and we've learned that uh, from going to, to different places. Um, Margaret also makes it a point to ask people if, they, uh, if there's anybody that drinks a lot of alcohol, if they smoke, if they do drugs, uh, and other things. And she, she really has to weed out these cases because sometimes people are maybe delusional um it, it, margaret do you have anything you want to interject there because you you actually go through the cases before we see them well i wouldn't say really delusional i just look and check the um we talk about different things and um if they if they sound you know like it's a true haunting and all that then we will pick it up and do it. Okay. Um, and Margaret, I have to ask you, are you monitoring the comments, by the way? I am. I'm, um, there was a lot of them saying that it keeps freezing. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm looking at the video myself, and it seems fine to me when my computer's the one that always freezes. But um, a lot of people are saying that it's freezing on them. Um, it's like the, the internet connection, so uh, please just be patient. Um, we, have, we have no control over the internet connection. It's probably because a lot of people are online tonight. So, um, so, um, so tonight, uh, let, me, let me give you a little uh, background about um, about ghosts, and then I'll get, get into uh, a couple of different cases. I'll tell you about a couple of different cases. Um, and we're gonna specialize, just in, uh, focus rather on one case tonight, because uh, the one case that we're gonna talk about tonight involves a number of different things. So first, a little bit of basics for the, the people who um, are just joining this and, and are new. Um, basically, ghosts are earthbound entities that are energy spirits are also energy but they cross over into the light so both of them are energy with memories personality and knowledge and ghosts choose to stay in a fixed location of uh, of their choosing when they pass on earth and they choose to stay there for a number of reasons and I'll, we'll explore that in in one of the cases the case that we're going to talk about tonight um Spirits cross over, and most people and pets cross over. So they're, they're always mostly on the other side. It's very rare that somebody stays behind. Um, what are the reasons that we found that some people stay behind? Well, some people stay behind because they, they feel as if they lived a bad life and they're afraid to cross over. They think that there's nothing but bad things on the other side, and that's not true. Um, they uh, also may have unfinished business um, and they think that they can finish it, if you will, by staying here and they can't do that. Um, they, they really need to cross over as a spirit and then they can influence people to help them and do, you know, accomplish what they want. Um, so they also use energy to get strong enough to, co to convey a message, which is why we use things like a K2 meter to register electromagnetic activity. Um, the more energy they have, the more they can do. Think about a ghost as a light bulb. And if you only put a little electricity in it, it's very dim. If you plug it in and you turn the electricity all the way up, it lights up very brightly. And that's exactly what a ghost is like. So ghosts, and that's what we're talking about today. We're not talking about the spirits of your loved ones who have crossed over. Ghosts who stay earthbound um, and spirits use heat, light, water, and electricity. So that's why when we go on paranormal investigations, we always uh, keep extra battery packs because they are known to drain battery packs. 
So we often keep those battery packs in a vehicle outside because if we carry them with, uh, with us, they'll drain them while, <laughs> while we're wearing them. Um, so you'll see flashlights go on and off. Um, we've been on a couple of cases where um, other electrical uh, equipment has gone on and off. Uh, one little girl in a Maryland mansion that's featured in the book turned on a television to let us know that she was there when, when we were in a room. Um, so uh, they also use negative emotional energy. Those are ghosts. And that is fear, anxiety, depression, and anger. So if anybody's feeling anxious or nervous when they go into a place that may be haunted, you're basically giving them enough energy to communicate. And by communicate, I mean maybe move something, make a noise, make some footsteps, uh, actually speak audibly, which takes a lot of energy. Um, you may see them uh, visibly. You may see them as a shadow. Or you may feel them as a cold spot. And the reason you feel them as a cold spot is because what they do is they take the energy from the molecules of air that are moving and they remove that energy, slowing the molecules down, creating colder air. Because cold air is cre cold air is slow moving molecules of air. Warm air is fast moving molecules of air. So that said, there, there are all the basics in like three minutes. <laughs> so now you know why we take the, the equipment that we take. Um, that said, there are a couple of uh, different forms that ghosts can take, too. Of course, I mentioned visible, uh, I mentioned shadow, <clears throat> and they can also be an orb. Now, we don't put a lot of stock in orbs, but in a couple of our investigations, we have seen orbs whenever we felt the presence of a ghost. Um, in one particular investigation in the book, uh, it was featured in another book of mine, too. It's called The Double Murder Ghost Investigation. And in that investigation, we captured an orb um, and in the face of the orb was the, I'm, I'm sorry in the orb was the face of a woman that we believe is uh, one of the the victims who of a murder that is haunting that particular place here's a here's a quick look at it I'm gonna see if I can get this to the camera um, you may be able to see the face in that particular orb um, and in that particular, in that particular case, that's called the double murder ghost investigation. So that's one of our most famous cases. Um, and, uh, that involves, uh, all right, I think I should be back up. Now I have to refresh. Um, okay. Uh, if I am back live, I apologize to everybody. I uh, don't understand what's going on with the internet connections here tonight. Um, yes, I think, yeah, we're back up. And it says erupted. <laughs> I think there's too many people online. Yeah. Yeah in the entire country. <laughs> yep. Um, all right, so we're back up. Um, okay. So we're gonna pick up from where I think I left off. Um, and that is, is that when you go into somebody's home, you never know what to expect. Um, we talked, I talked about how uh, some homes are in disarray and that, that adds negative energy. Um, uh, there are also a couple of different types of hauntings, okay? One is residual. That means that if anybody has an emotional um, episode in, in a home like anger, that emotional energy will permeate the walls and that will stick, that will stay there. So if anybody is sensitive like a medium or uh, somebody that just is pretty emotional, you can go into a home and you may feel bad or, or you may feel unsettled. And what you're doing is you're reading that emotional residual energy that was basically impressed upon the wall uh, from whatever event had happened there. Um, the other type of haunting is basically a, an intelligent haunt. And that means that there's an actual ghost that decided to inhabit that particular dwelling. Now, there have been cases where we have found that a ghost 
um, from a nearby dwelling would seek another dwelling if if the dwelling in which they originally stayed in was torn down. Um, that's that's happened. Um, sometimes ghosts are actually known to stay outside. Uh, we've encountered some Native American ghosts um, in different places. Um, so before I get into the case, um, I will just tell you a couple of a couple of other highlights. We talked about the double murder ghost investigation. Um, we took you on a, a walking tour of Baltimore's Federal Hill area, and there are quite a number of ghosts there. And uh, Margaret um, Margaret led that, and then uh, Rhonda, who is the historian of the group, she was able to go through uh, some archives, and she was able to find out um, that the ghosts that I talked to were indeed uh, people that were in newspapers back in the day, like the 1800s, 1700s, and so forth. So that was pretty cool how she was able to prove that. And those those things are also in the book. Um, there was, uh, we ran into a house where we met ghosts of different time periods. And when ghosts decide to dwell in a place from different time periods, sometimes they do not know the other is there. That's kind of odd to me, and I can't explain it, but that's what we've encountered. Um, we uh, we also have another case in the book that I call um, a, a spirit dog, a grandmother, and a burned ghost. And that's a fascinating case because we were, we were actually called into a private residence. Um, somebody thought that their dog was visiting in spirit which we were able to confirm but there were there was a, a another spirit there a human spirit and um there was a burn victim who was actually haunting the house um and had uh, attached herself to one of the people in the house so that's that's a really fascinating story and we actually were able to find out the name of the person um Rob, I think you're off again. I am? Uh, yeah, I think you're off. It says I'm live. Okay. Um, it's telling me that I'm having trouble playing the video. So maybe I just lost it. If somebody is in there and they, they, they are hearing and seeing Rob, can you comment? Yes, please let me know if you can still um, if you can still see me. Yeah, I'm not getting anything. It is 7:35, so just let me know if you're there. Nobody's commenting. No. Okay. You know what? I think. Uh, I guess the gun stuff. Yeah. I think I think maybe we will um, we will reschedule this. Um, it's, there's been there's been far too many technical difficulties here. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! It looks good. We're good. We're good. Everybody's still there. Sorry. <sighs> okay. It's so hard to concentrate and give a lecture. So I apologize to everybody who's watching. It's hard to concentrate when your system keeps crashing and you never know if you're you're online and i keep forgetting what i was going to say next so um all right so i think what i will do in the essence of time is skip other things and just go right to the story um because i i don't and now i see that it's frozen again now I'm seeing you. Keep going. Okay. All right. Um, so just a couple more things about the different cases that are in here. One, we uh, investigated a Maryland mansion, a historic mansion in Maryland um, for many years, actually. And uh, it's now off limits to the public, uh, especially in terms of paranormal investigations. We couldn't include the name of the mansion, but there are plenty of different ghosts in there. 
and they're most of them are from different time periods as well so um i think there are seven different entities in there margaret do you happen to remember the number um it was right around there i don't remember exactly okay um well it's it's definitely worth worth reading about because it, it's amazing why everybody stayed because everybody had a different reason to stay behind um some felt guilty some were murdered there some died of sickness um but everybody had a different reason and we were actually able to prove uh the identities of some of them um there are uh we went to the uh, um uh, historic society of howard county and investigated there and we found some interesting hauntings um as well and we, actually we were able to in the book you'll see a sketch that i drew out because when i'm i go on paranormal investigations i'm actually able to see um, what a ghost looks like in my mind and then i sketch it out and we were able to uh find a picture of uh, a gentleman that used to work in in this particular building and compare it and they look very similar so um we were able to figure out his identity um there was another ghost that we met in an alleyway that um we were able to confirm that's what the homeowner that is the entity that the homeowner saw um so uh, margaret are there any questions in there that no, I, mean, no, I don't no see questions. any questions okay um a couple of investigations that we went on by the way involved people that used ouija boards so there's a caution in here um you know there are people that actually use ouija boards and they're they try to be protective of themselves and they try to be careful uh i i just don't believe in using them because they can open doors to bad things that can come in with the good things um you know everybody has their own opinion about that but um we've gone on several cases where somebody in the home has used a ouija board and it's led to an, uh, illnesses within uh, all the family members um, and others have led to different bad entities coming in uh, margaret would you like to add to that um okay I, i'm sorry i was lost i was typing about about ouija boards we're, we're talking about So some, something to think about. What what was it, what's disturbing to me is that it was marketed as a child's toy. And by the way, children have the ability to see ghosts uh, better than adults because they uh, they are not yet taught to think with a logical mind. Adults try to explain things away. That's why we right. can't see them. So Rob, we have um, Roy, of course. Is very much with you on it. He's a bad mojo in his opinion. Um, Cynthia has asked, how and why does the Ouija board work? And Cynthia, in my opinion, you can use anything as a device to speak from your world to another world. It's your intention on what makes it happen and how it works. So you don't have to have a physical Ouija board to do it. You can use um, a pendulum. You can use um, a flashlight like we do on investigation. You know, you can use anything and talk to the other side. Um, how a Ouija board works I think it's all an intent what do you think Ralph yeah I, 
I think that when you uh, when you invite someone in, um, they can actually use uh, energy to move that that um, device across across the board and spell things out. Um, so it's really it's really the use of energy, which is what a ghost is. Um, uh, I see that Roy says that you invite entities by by using it, and and you trust they are who they say they are, and you know you can't see them, so they may not be who who they say they are. Um, you know you can always you can always use it and um, get like your grandmother to come through, but there are going to be people waiting up waiting lined up behind her and they may not be good people um because uh, a lot of a lot of ghosts or, uh, want to uh, want to get through a lot of spirits want to get through too so uh, so i would just avoid the ouija board you know uh go to a medium <laughs> that way you don't have to worry about opening doors that that uh, go to bad places um so speaking of that in order to wrap up um, the last part of this, I would like to talk about one case in the book that I call, it's uh, chapter 16 of the book, it's called Two Ghosts, One Attachment, a Spirit, and Poltergeist Activity. Now, when we go into these houses, we never know what to expect, as I said in, at the beginning, before the video went out. Um, so sometimes we hope that there's really nothing there. I mean, our primary purpose to go in first is to debunk things. We want to try and explain things. Um, you know, we, so uh, my husband Tom is an architect, so he can explain like house settling noises and so forth, um, and pipe noises and, and various other things. Um, we have K2 meters that can explain uh, bad feelings if you're in the basement and there's an electrical box that may not be grounded properly. Those are those are things that can be explained logically, um, but we never know what to expect in terms of the number of entities. If there is a number of entities, um, in terms in terms of the double murder investigation, there were two ghosts that were earthbound because there were two women that were murdered in a home. Um, in this particular case, the one about two ghosts and attachment and uh, pol poltergeist activity. Um, there were a number of different things going on, and I, Margaret, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I thought the homeowner thought it was all attributed to one particular entity. Is that correct? Or did she have, did she think there were multiple entities? Um, I think it was one entity. So See, you're going back a while, a way, so. Yeah. <laughs> all in my mind so we found three entities and poltergeist activity um for those of you who don't know what a poltergeist is a poltergeist is actually not a ghost it, although the word poltergeist is german and i think it means noisy ghost um it's really not a ghost what a poltergeist is it's uh, it's mental energy it's emotional energy that can be used to simulate the activities of a ghost. So it's usually from somebody who's going through an emotional time or uh, emotional changes or turmoil. Um, and we have uh, we had a number of poltergeist cases. Some of them are in the book. I think there are two or three of them in the book. Um, and they are mostly created by teenagers. Um, in this particular case, it was, it was a teenage girl. Um, and she had a younger sister, and they had um, a friendly rivalry, I guess, going on. Um, so the younger daughter reported seeing shadow, shadow people, a shadow person in her her bedroom. Um, after this was after the investigation ended, we were able to piece that together. Um, uh, Tom on the team had noticed that the older daughter seemed to be a little um, adversarial to the younger daughter when we were there. Normally people aren't in the home, but in this particular case, the two daughters are there and, and the mother. Um, so Tom noted that and 
we were able to determine that <clears throat> the older daughter was actually creating poltergeist activity. She was actually projecting her energy into the bedroom of the of her sister and creating these uh, impressions of a uh, of a ghost. Um, so long story short, with that, after the case, after we kind of filed a report on the case and presented everything, um, the mother said that the older daughter was getting counseling, and I, I believe the, the poltergeist activity stopped. Do you remember that, Margaret? Yes, I do. Um, it, it was. It was. Um, it took quite a while, and it, this this case took several months because I think we had gone in two different times. Might have been three. Yes, but, it was March but, and April. Yeah, but one of the times, no, there was later on too, because um, um, right. Three times. She pulled, yeah, she pulled someone else in there um, because I was away. So then we had to go back in and clear all that up, too, with another group going in on top of us. And then she called us back in. And it was after that that she finally um, got her daughter the, the help that she needed. And she moved out of the house, and that's what made it stop. Once her daughter moved out, she told me she had no other problems in the house. Okay. Very good. Um, so uh, one of the interesting things about this particular case is, uh, well, well, first of all, before I, I get into that, Margaret never tells the mediums anything about what the homeowner has put in her report or what the homeowner has discussed with Margaret. So as a medium, um, <clears throat> I knew nothing about it. All I knew was the address one hour before we got there. Um, same thing with Troy. Uh, Troy is another medium in the group. And what's interesting here is that both of us on the way to the home um, zeroed in on a jewelry box and a piece of jewelry that was a cause of one of the problems. Now that's really unusual for both of us to get the same exact thing, but <clears throat> it, it acted as a confirmation. So as we went through the house and, and tried to get a feel for what, we, what was in there, um, we were looking for a jewelry box. Um, when, we, when we got down to the, uh, the first floor after going through the entire house, uh, the mother of the house was there and she had with her a jewelry box on the kitchen table. And we thought, okay, there's the jewelry box. And we asked her why she had it. <clears throat> well, in the jewelry box, there was a piece of jewelry that her daughter had brought from, had purchased from Central America when she was on vacation. And the mom said that ever since the daughter brought that piece of jewelry back and that box from Central America, that's when all the weird things started happening in the house. So that was a, that was a really interesting confirmation between uh, what she actually figured out and what Troy and I figured out before we even got there. <clears throat> As it turned out, we, we found out that the, that the man who actually created the jewelry in Central America had died and he had, his ghost had attached itself to this piece of jewelry. And he was not a happy guy. Um, you know, we maintain our per personalities and memories and, and so forth when we pass. Um, and it's very rare that, uh, that a ghost attaches themselves to an object. I've only seen it a couple of times, but it, it's very rare. But this this happened in this particular case. Um, so, Margaret, I was not on the investigation that the the part of the investigation afterward where you disposed of the um, the object. Would you like to talk about that for a moment? Um, didn't we burn it? 
Yes, I understand that you burned it in the backyard. Um, <clears throat> if Amy and Jimmy are on, I think that Amy and Jimmy were both there at the, at the time. Um, we burned it, and then we buried it. And you buried the ashes? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what was left of it, we buried, because it said, put it back to Mother Earth. That's what the... What everybody kept saying, put it back to Mother Earth. So, so if you have an object that you think may have negative energy or maybe may have a ghostly attachment, you may want to take it outside and burn it and then bury it, bury the remnants of it. Um, we find too that whenever we're outside, sometimes we will go um, touch a tree because trees connect to, to earth and it grounds you and, it, and, and you get that energy uh, to pass through. Um, as just a way to expunge the negative energy. So that's what we had to do. Um, so that was fascinating because, again, ghosts usually don't attach themselves to objects. There was one other incident that I remember seeing a ghost attached to an object, and that was when I was walking in old Ellicott City in Maryland, and there's a rocking chair that used to be for sale at one of the um, antique places, and that rocking chair would rock by itself. And uh, when I talked to the shop owner, they said that it belonged to an old man and that they truly believe that that old man decides to sit and rock um, in, his, in his favorite chair. He won't let it go. Um, so there's that. Um, so let me see where, where we are. Um, we also ran into a when we were doing the investigation in this particular house before we crossed <clears throat> before we helped cross this ghost over this this attachment um we were up in the the mother's bedroom and uh this was very odd for me because as a you know as a medium you can you can hear people in your head uh it's clear audience and suddenly an older gentleman came to me and he was speaking a foreign language. I think it was Italian or Greek, I can't remember which one it was. Um, but I, I recognized it as whatever language it was. <clears throat> and, um, and he was very chatty. And he made me, although I didn't understand what he was saying, I, I understood the sentiment of it, that he was there to protect the family. So um, I remember standing in her bedroom and she came in um, I was standing there with Troy, and I think Margaret was there, and Rhonda, and she came in and I told her, I said, there's an older gentleman here who is related to you that's speaking a foreign language, and I don't understand him, but he's here to protect you. And she immediately said that was her dad. She said, I, she said that her dad uh, did not speak English. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, so that what that tells me is that you know language is actually not a barrier because they can actually share emotions with with mediums and let you know what they're trying to convey so there was that um the investigation wrapped up as the investigation wrapped up um the medium's investigation which was the second part um i remember being standing in the kitchen and um uh, feeling that a, a cat brushed by me and um i didn't see the cat and I, everybody was there in the kitchen with me and we were talking to the homeowner and i said to the homeowner do you have a cat that just walked by and she said no we don't have a cat but we have seen a ghost cat here <laughs> since we moved in so i thought that was pretty fascinating for some reason that's that's previous owner's cat they decided to stay behind um, normally that, again, that doesn't happen very often. Probably about 5% of the animals stay behind, 95% cross over. Um, so one of the, one of the final things that struck me about this particular investigation, because there was a spirit that was visiting to protect the family from an earthbound ghost. Um, there was a ghost cat, which nobody needed protection from. Um, and there were poltergeist, there was poltergeist activity generated by one of the daughters in the home. Now, I, I consider this house kind of a hotbed of, of paranormal activity. 
and what struck me odd is that the home was in a neighborhood where there were high tension wires uh, nearby. I think probably within a half a mile. Do you remember that, Margaret? Yeah. And well, sorry, I'm kind of reading some of that too. What that? That's okay. So, so if one thing I I understand from reading some reports and hearing some stories, some reading some news stories, is that those high tension wires actually can leak some electricity. Um, and remember, a ghost uses electricity. They use heat, light, water, and electricity in order to manifest and get strong enough to um, to send messages. So it very well could be that that house was a hotbed of paranormal activity because it was a, a great source of energy not more than a quarter of a mile away from, from it. Um, so that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, all in all, though, I believe that once the uh, once the piece of jewelry was burned and buried, that I think the activity had stopped. Um, I do know that, as Margaret mentioned, that the the um, poltergeist activity stopped because the, the older daughter got counseling and then she moved out. Um, and the spirit of the dad probably was always there visiting back and forth because he always wanted to protect his daughter. Um, and as for the ghost cat, that ghost cat will probably be there forever. Um, Margaret, do you have anything you want to add to this story? Well, actually, the, um, the necklace was um, destroyed during like the first investigation. Um, and I think that's when the poltergeist started because the daughter wanted more attention or something and that's when we had to go back in and um it wasn't until um we crossed over i think what was in the basement we crossed over um another ghost and that's when it finally stopped you know that her daughter moved out the poltergeist stopped and um she finally got her home back. Yeah, so she had a lot. Of, she had a lot of things going on there. Um, and fortunately, she was able to find some peace after the all, after uh, all of our visits. I think there were three visits in total. Um, so that's just one example of of the cases that that are in um, in this book, Case Files of Inspired Ghost Tracking, um, and include. It also includes a lot of. Uh, sketches that I did of, of ghosts that um, that I saw. One is a steel worker's ghost. Um, another is a guy from the 1800s that lived um, down near Silver Spring. Um, I, actually, this is this is a sketch that I did of him. Um, and uh, it, it's just it's just interesting and and kind of scary actually to go into a house and not know what to expect um in one particular case i will say that uh troy went into a house that had a lot of residual energy bad residual energy and he actually saw the energy coalesce as like a giant dragon <laughs> what appeared to be a giant dragon it appeared to be uh, a giant dragon on somebody's bed um and that's again that's residual energy all coming together um, based on some really horrible things that happened in that particular home. Um, but uh, we, as, as paranormal investigators, always have to protect ourselves, and we do that by, you, by banding together before we go into place. We imagine white light around us. We say a, a prayer of protection, um, and then, then we go in and do what we have to do to find out who's there, why they're there, and help them cross over and find peace. Um, because... Earthbound ghosts do not belong here. They need to cross over and go into spirit on the other side, where they can find peace and join their loved ones. And we've done a lot of crossings. We've done a lot of crossings over. And that basically involves banding each, banding together, combining our emotional energies, opening a portal, if you will, like a doorway of light to the other side, and then often calling um, 
calling on relatives that are in in spirit on the other side to to convince their ghostly relative to cross over um, so it, and it takes a lot it takes a lot of energy to, and it's an emotional emotionally exhausting thing to do and we always always feel emotionally exhausted afterward um, and the other thing too is that after investigations once you're in a place of negative energy you need to get that negative energy off you so you can go you know connect to a tree um and and feel that energy drain away from you you can take a shower on um, margaret likes to eat chocolate because uh, chocolate is grounder chocolate is a grounder. grounder so yes eat the chocolate yes so if uh, and and that goes for anything, it doesn't have to be a paranormal problem. Just uh, you know, just eat some chocolate and you'll feel better. So anyway, um, with that, I am going to close. Um, uh, thanks for all your patience, everybody out there. I know that we've had serious technical difficulties tonight, um, uh, but and I apologize for that. But you can't help the internet. Um, I, Margaret, is there one more question in there? Before we go, there was no question that I saw. Carla, of course, said hi to you. Okay. Um, I see you have um, friends coming around the corner at you. All right. So here, yeah. here, Cynthia is asking, have you ever had a ghost attached to you um, of someone you know? Uh, no. Um, usually, ghosts do not attach to people um there are exceptions they will follow people um in the incident of incident case of the burned ghost if you read the book um, you'll learn that this patient in a hospital attached themselves to a woman that she thought could help her cross over um and so it's it happens it's rare um, we had another incident too, it's not in the book, but someone from our own paranormal group was in a hospital, again, in a hospital, and so a ghost who, who was dwelling in the hospital attached themselves to our uh, group member who came to our meeting, and we had to cross this ghost over. That's another story for another time. So, so it does happen, but it's very rare. And the only reason it seems to me that ghosts will attach themselves to people is because they think that the person can help them cross over and find their family on the other side. So, um, it, again, rarity in that and rarity in attaching themselves to objects, but it does happen, you know. And you know, certainly we don't know everything. We haven't run into everything, but um, what we have run into are some pretty weird things. And and you'll read about read about them in the case files of Inspired Ghost Tracking. So, um, with that, I'm going to give you the rest of your night back. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, my my book is available on Amazon. It's like I think it's like nine ninety nine. This is the cover of it. Case files of inspired ghost tracking. These are my other books, by the way. Pets in the afterlife. Uh, for anybody who lost a pet, by the way, I'm going to throw this plug out there. Tomorrow I'm going to be doing a live a live fundraising event for uh, Dachshund Rescue, and you can find the information on my page, my Facebook page. Uh, Go, uh, or just go to robgutro.com or petspirits.com and you'll find it. But you have to register because it's a fundraiser. I don't know what they're charging, probably $10, $20. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of lectures related to pets. Um, but that's tomorrow and I'll be doing that at two o'clock. So if you know anybody that lost a pet, have them tune in. And um, hopefully you, they'll be able to get some comfort. Meanwhile, um, everybody stay safe out there wear your masks um you don't need to be one of the ghosts that we investigate uh that's for sure um we just want you to be healthy and uh and so you can go on your own paranormal investigations yeah if you grab the book you can go on paranormal investigation of uh, baltimore's federal hill just take the book with you and you'll you'll meet the ghosts that we went that meet we met so all right, everybody. Well, thank you again. And um, if you have any questions or you, if you're interested in joining the group, we do these lectures the beginning, the first Friday of every month. And they're online until further notice. Um, and uh, drop Margaret a note.
so thanks and have a good night.